This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. Today, Professor Pravesh Khatri will tell us how diagnosing and treating infectious disease can be improved by asking our immune system what's going on. The immune system has evolved and is very good at sensing what's happening in our bodies, and a new approach to understanding infectious disease is to just ask the immune system what it's detecting. It's the future of infectious disease immunology. A huge fraction of deaths worldwide occur because of infectious disease, bacteria, and viruses. COVID and influenza are viruses. Strep throat and urinary tract infections are from bacteria, for example. We treat them differently. We use antibiotics for bacteria, but we have to use antivirals for viruses. Sometimes doctors don't know what they're dealing with. Well, Professor Pravesh Khatri from Stanford University figured out that you can ask the immune system what it's dealing with. After millions of years of evolution, the immune system has figured out when it's dealing with a bacteria and when it's dealing with a virus, and we just have to ask it. He'll tell us that he's developed new ways to diagnose both infection by bacteria and by viruses, and he can even figure out when you're in trouble and this infection is going to be bad and when you're going to clear the infection with no problem. So Pravesh, your work focuses on diagnostics that use the immune system as a marker for what might be going on in the body, either autoimmune disease or infection. Tell me why this approach is different and why it has so much promise now after many years of doing diagnostics in very different ways. Sure. So um, if you think about uh, immune system, it had one job or one of the most important job as during the evolution was find what is dangerous to the host, respond to it by proliferating, and when that danger signal is gone, shut down that immune response. So as an electronics engineer, that's the perfect diagnostic, right? It's a distributed sensor, immune system continuously surveils with a built-in amplifier. So it, it amplifies the signal when there is a danger, the immune cells proliferate, and then when the pathogen or whatever is gone, it shuts down. And that is why it's, it's so, so attractive. And, and the second reason that I really think immune system is going to play a crucial role in diagnostic is, until now we've been looking for a pathogen, but now it's very well established that when you look for pathogen, immune system actually learn how not, lot, not to let get pathogen throughout your entire body because then it becomes sepsis and you die. So if you are looking for a pathogen in a, if it, it People have compared it to needle in a haystack kind of a situation. But here is the problem. You are not looking for a needle in a haystack. There is no needle in the haystack because the immune system has already sequestered the ah. pathogen. So you could, you could deep sequence the, 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 the blood until the end of the time, but the immune system made sure that it doesn't get there. And that's why we need to, that's, that's the second reason that I, I really think that immune system has a true potential to be a, a fantastic diagnostic. So uh, let's step back for a second. What does a regular person need to understand about the immune system? It seems complicated, and I know you're querying it and using it as you just described. So tell me, can you give us a little primer on how the immune system works and what are the challenges of using it for diagnostics? Yeah, um, so imagine immune system is, is a network of sensors in your body. And just like any sensor, it has multiple different parts. There is uh, a set of cells that their job is to continuously look for danger signal. And when there is a danger signal found, isolate it and present it uh, to the rest of the immune system. And then there is a bunch of other immune cells, different types. You can imagine like B cells, T cells. We've learned about this during the pandemic. Um, and, and these are the cells whose, risk, whose job is to identify uh, what kind of danger signal it is and generate a corresponding response. Mm -hmm. Right? Great. Uh, that's it. That, there are different components that talk to each other and they have very specialized functions that work together. 
So I know that your application of these ideas to disease is very broad and very interesting, and I'm hoping to get into a lot of it. But I know that one of the first things that you did, and, and this relates to, I think many parents can relate to this, is you did work trying to tell the difference between a viral infection and a bacterial infection. And as you know very well, and many people know, bacteria are the ones that will respond to antibiotics, whereas viruses, until recently, we really didn't have any treatments. Now we have some antivirals. But even for physicians, it can be very difficult to tell, is this patient infected by a bacteria or a virus? And yet that has a huge difference in how they're going to manage it. And the reason I mentioned parents is when your kid has an ear infection and you take them to the doctor, the thing that the doctor is trying to figure out is, does this child need antibiotics because this looks bacterial? Or is this going to be a virus? It'll be self-limited. It'll get better. So tell me, using that as an example, tell me how... Uh, in the old days, I know we would just try to culture the bacteria out of the ear or, and say what's growing. You have a different approach. Can you take us through that? For, for uh, differentiating <clears throat> bacteria and viruses, right? Yes. So, on a, and I'm, I'm simplifying here dramatically. So there might be That's what some, we love. That's what we love. Some, some <laughs> inaccuracies, but they are, they are purposeful inaccuracies. So imagine bacteria and virus. Um, usually bacteria are not inside the cell. Usually they are outside the cell. And viruses usually go inside the cell. And the reason for this, uh, evolutionarily speaking, is um, bacteria has all the machinery it needs to replicate itself. Whereas virus doesn't. It uses the host machinery, our, yes. our cell replication machinery to replicate itself. And this is gross simplification but let's put that on the side. So immune system over the evolution learn that there are two types of danger signal, one that is outside the cell and one that is inside the cell. And depending on whether it's inside or the outside, it learn um, uh, what host response to, to generate to get rid of that um, uh, uh, danger. And we, we, we analyzed large amount of data where uh, we had different bacterial and, and, and viral infections. And we figured out what is it that immune system did not change during the evolution, that no matter what kind of bacteria or virus it was, it always generated that response. And that's what we are now starting to read. I see. So uh, let me ask, um, how hard is it to distinguish these two? Now that you've done a, a bunch of work in this area, are there indeed signals that are very reliable? It, they are extremely reliable. Um, we've now shown that whether uh, what country or continent you were born and raised in, what your race and ethnic background is, what strain of a pathogen you are infected with, whether you have some comorbidities or not, like the obesity, autoimmune diseases, immunosuppression, um, irrespective of these, or, or you have even both bacterial and viral infections together, because that ah. also happens, you can always see that there are these conserved immune responses to these this types of pathogen, and you can target them. Um, so how, this is ex very exciting. So let me ask, I, I guess the obvious question is, how close is this to routine use, A, and are doctors excited about this or does this disrupt them in some way? Um, so I'll answer the second question. Doctors are definitely excited. Uh, I've heard repeatedly and I still hear it that they, they can't wait to try this out in their clinics. So that's really exciting. Um, that wasn't the case about seven, eight years ago, but now it is definitely. And, and the reason that they are excited is because um, we are, I, I want to say, less than a year into this actually becoming uh, clinically available with a point of care machine that you could, uh, you could use as a, a, a single blood draw, less than 40 minute turnaround time from sample to answer. So that's very exciting, and that will happen definitely even in the lifetime of those of us who are getting older rapidly. Uh, so, okay, so that's great. So um, do, did you have to um, 
I think I know this. I know the answer. I believe you had to combine both ex, um, uh, development of devices, as you just described, and also computational analysis. So tell me a little bit about the computational analysis. Is this using uh, fancy AI? Is this old-fashioned analysis? How, how do these algorithms work that try to pick up these signals? So um, it's not fancy AI. To be, to be really honest, the stuff that we are using now was developed sometime in mid-70s. The, the difference is, there are two differences. One, we have so much data available that we are now make better use of the methods that were developed years ago, decades ago. And then the second thing is we, 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 we changed a few things in this 50-year-old algorithm that what was the, the fundamental guideline for using it, we are ignoring it. So instead of making sure that the data sets are comparable to each other, we make sure that they are as disjointed from each other as possible. And what that has allowed us to do, and, and the reason for doing that was we wanted to find solution that is not biased. And in, 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 in today's AI, that's a continuous discussion yes. of avoiding biases. And, and if you want to truly help patients, you need to make sure that there are no hidden biases. And your, your solution has to be broadly applicable to large number of patient population across the globe. So what we've been doing, we, the, the methods that we developed are to account for these biases implicitly. We are not accounting for them explicitly, but implicitly you're making sure that there is biological, clinical, and technical heterogeneity that we can, we can uh, represent in our data. And that allows us to make sure that um, um, when we go to real world patient population, be it in Africa or, or uh, Europe or Asia or, or North America, it's the single solution that, that continues to work across the globe. Yes, yeah, so, so so that really does make sense. And in fact, earlier in your comments, you talked about all the different disease states that people might be in where it still works, all the different geography where it still works. And so clearly that all, you, the, your ability to make those statements comes from this approach. And in fact, I know that on the, on the internet, I can find talks that you've given about dirty data. And I'm suspecting that this is what you mean is that, uh, not that it's, not, not that it's bad data, but that by having it be real world and from multiple sources, you can really check to make sure that this technology that is promising in the lab remains promising when it's deployed into the real world. Exactly. Like, uh, um, let's, let's take a very simple example of any discovery that goes to, to patient. The first time it is described in a paper through lab experiments or whatever, we know that it does not immediately go to patients because the first thing we get asked is, can you show that it works in another cohort? And what yes. we are implicitly saying is, I know your patient population was not representative of the real world patient population. Show me that if you were to now go out and do the same thing in a different patient population or a more, more heterogeneous patient population, it would still work. And that's where most things die. So right. we wanted to avoid that pitfall. We wanted to make sure that our a priori odds of success in real world were better than 70, 80 percent. And that's why we, instead of starting with homogeneous one cohort, we decided to start with heterogeneous multiple cohort. And you asked me earlier about AI. Um, as we ask more sophisticated questions using this, uh, we do realize that we are now starting to to uh, include more uh, 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 neural network based approaches because now from the same set of variables, we are trying to ask multiple different questions and I'll give you an example. Yes. Uh, uh, one of the thing that we started out was just trying to differentiate whether the patient has bacterial infection or a viral infection. But there is even a bigger problem, which is many times we don't even know whether the patient is infected or not before we can ask a question, is this bacterial or a viral infection? So now we, we need to decide whether there is a presence of infection. If yes, what's the type of the infection? And then the third question that comes right after that is, uh, if you show up at two o'clock in the morning in an emergency department is, should I let this patient go home or it's going to turn into sepsis and I need to uh, admit them to ICU. So there are three questions that we need to answer. 
presence, type, and severity of infection. And we need to be able to do in under an hour, let's say, but, but much earlier yes. if we could. So now with the small number of variables that we have identified that generalize to the rest of the, the, the entire world's population, um, uh, we need to come up with better classification models. And that's where we are starting to use like multi-layer perceptrons, support vector machines, neural networks, depending on, on the question, so that using a very small number of variables that you can measure in under an hour, you can answer multiple different questions using a single test. I'm very interested in your third category. They're all very interesting, but that third category of severity gets to uh, the, the next topic that I wanted to talk about, which is now you're not just diagnosing a disease, but you're also looking into the future a little bit. And I, and I wanted to ask the degree to which that immune system that you're, that you're studying is giving you good indicators, not only of what's happening now, but what's going to happen. Yes. And it sounds like it is giving signal. Exactly. And, and, and this goes back to um, uh, immune system being a distributed sensor with a built-in amplifier. You are now immune system, you can imagine, is the trigger for the symptoms that you are going to see an hour later, a day later, or a week later, depending on that kind of disease you have. So if you are reading immune system correctly, you are getting an earlier indication of what's going to happen. Uh, and, and that's where the advantage comes in. And I'll give you a very specific example. Um, and then the other thing is you can't fool immune system because immune system always tells you, well, I've been looking at this for a few million years, right? <laughs> So here is a specific example. We were looking at this bacterial viral infection diagnosis, and we came across a, a study where, where, patient, where there were healthy volunteers, um, more like my, younger than me, uh, 20 to 30 oh, wow. year olds, um, who were asked to inhale a live influenza virus and then go in quarantine for seven days. And they would take blood sample every eight hours, do a nasal RT-PCR to see whether they were infected or not. And usually about 50% of the people get infected if you are exposed to, to live virus. And we could show that our diagnostic signature was actually identifying who has influenza infection about 24 hours before their symptoms would show up on, on, yeah. uh, on average. But what was really remarkable was there were two people. One our uh, diagnostic said is not infected, but showed symptom every single day. And another that showed no symptom, but immune system said you are infected. Huh. So we asked the original study author, like why, what's going on here? And they said, the, the one that showed no symptom, but you said is infected, that was asymptomatically infected person. It was, she was shedding virus every day, didn't show symptom, but immune system was actually saying there is a danger signal, I'm responding to it. And then the other one is what we would call a hypochondriac. Never shedded a virus, <laughs> never had any infection, but showed every single symptom because it thought he actually had inhaled the live virus. So immune system was actually picking up what's going on. Don't argue with an Im immune system that has been developing for millions of years. Well, this is the future of everything with Russ Altman. More with Pravesh Khatri next. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman and I'm speaking with Professor Pravesh Khatri from Stanford University. In the last segment, Pravesh described how he can use the immune system to understand whether a bacterial infection is happening or a viral infection. He's basically listening in to the immune system and letting it tell him what's going on. In this segment, he'll tell us about exciting new advances in the detection of tuberculosis, which is the number one all-time killer of humans by infectious disease. He'll also tell us how signals from the immune system give us clues about how best to treat patients using precision medicine. So, Pravesh, I know you've been working on tuberculosis, and some of it is progressing to the clinic pretty rapidly. So what are the challenges with tuberculosis? Many of us hear about it. We all get our, um, our little, little test at the doctor every few years. Um, sometimes we have to take medications. Where are we with tuberculosis, and what's the promise here? So tuberculosis, just to set the stage, um, it has killed 1 billion people in the history of mankind. And that is every pandemic in the known history combined, plus all the world wars combined, times two. Right? Nobody, nothing has killed as many people as tuberculosis. And in 21st century, 
as of 2020, we are still not able to diagnose 40% of the patients across the world. Wow. So that's the, that's the, 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 the severity of the disease. It still kills, used to be among the top 10, it is back in top five uh, 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 reasons for mortality worldwide. And, and WHO has set this guideline for, uh, or, or set an, a goal for ending TB by 2035. And what they've asked is, they want a non-sputum-based uh, test because the current test requires that patient cough off a sputum and then culture it, which takes anywhere from one to three weeks. So they want something that is fast and is as good um, as the current uh, standard of care. It's also very unpleasant to get sputum up and some patients just can't do it. Yes, especially like children and, and patients with HIV co-infection. Right. So mm -hmm. they can't even generate sputum. So um, we set out to do this about 2016, so about six years ago. And we found that there is a three gene signature in peripheral blood that would now diagnose whether you have active tuberculosis disease or not compared to healthy controls, those who have latent infection or any other lung disease. That was 2016. So wait a minute, when you say three gene signature, help, help, de help decode, what does that mean to somebody who's not a scientist? So um, uh, every cell expresses or, or has a certain number of genes that come from our genome. And depending on what kind of immune response you have, different genes are expressed. So not all genes are present in a cell at, any, at, at uh, every time. Uh, it depends on what condition you are in. So these three genes are only present in immune cells when you actually have tuberculosis. That's what okay. we found. Okay. And, and then a company in Sunnyvale um, licensed this from us, uh, from Stanford, created a cartridge, and uh, uh, two years ago, uh, a group of scientists across two continents in four countries showed that they could now measure this uh, a, a three gene signature using a finger stick, so it looks like Terra Nos, right? But what they showed is as but the it patient, works. it's a Terra Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but they could show that um, in in a, in a truly uh, a prospective trial at point of care in clinic across four countries, this three gene signature measured on a cartridge diagnosed TB in 45 minutes before the sputum left the clinic for culture, they knew what the patients had and they could send them home with the, with the treatment. The problem is um, getting it adopted um, uh, broadly. This is, as, we, as you said in the beginning, this is an entirely new kind of diagnostic tool. We haven't used this. We, we've been using host responses uh, for almost 150 years. It started with lactate. But the problem is it's been, uh, not a problem, but they've been, they've been protein-based biomarkers, not gene expression-based biomarkers. So yeah. we haven't had many of those or actually none in the, in the clinic. So, so raising awareness, showing that they are as good, if not better than the current diagnostics that we have. So that's the challenge that we are, we are going to go yeah, through. Yeah, so you raise a, an important point because I know that lots of the tuberculosis is, is occurring in the developing world where they're very resource constrained. And so is there an uh, effort to try to make this like super robust? A lot of these tests have to be conducted in like, uh, like tents or like temporary hospitals that also have other services. So um, is, is that one of the pushes of the work is to try to figure out how to get this to be robust and cheap? Exactly. So um, I would speak for the robust part. Cheap part is where, where the, given that the technology itself is new and there isn't a market, uh, yeah. one could argue that the cost is would be high. But as it gets more adopted, production scales up, prices are going to come down dramatically. 20 years ago, it took a few hundred or a few million dollars to sequence a genome. And now we are sequencing it at 100, 200 dollars, right? So the same thing is going to happen, but I think it's going to happen faster than the 20 year uh, as the uh, usage increases. Yes, and, and, and that, that seems to be how things can go when you uh, show initial uh, 
that it works, then all of a sudden that creates a whole ecosystem for different people who are good at engineering and, redu and reduction of technology to figure out how do we get this to cost pennies so we can deploy it broadly in, in, in places that really need it. Exactly. So my goal has been to demonstrate repeatedly over and over in different patient population, in different countries that this works. It is clinically useful. It can be translated in clinic. And then that would that would bring more people in and, and just move the field forward. Right. So in the last few minutes, I know you were also doing work in precision medicine. That is to say, you know, predicting what drugs would be best for patients. So could you set that up? What's the challenge here and how are you addressing it? Yeah. Um, so there are there are two kind of things we could we could uh, uh, imagine um, one. Uh, and I'll speak for one. And that is most drugs don't work across all the patients. Only a subset of the patients respond. And, and given that I've been very interested in, in infectious diseases, uh, that particular problem is very evident in sepsis. Um, just to uh, put some numbers on the, on the table, uh, every sepsis patient in state of California cost one day, one day in ICU is $19,000 a day. Uh, and that's the median price. It could it could be much higher, right? <clears throat> so the 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 problem has been, um, uh, if you if you look in the literature, about 150 drugs have been tried and they've all failed. There is no single drug that works. There was Zygris that was approved, and then post marketing it failed because it didn't work for everybody. And this is for sepsis. This for is very bad infections in the ICU. Right. It's about 45% uh, uh, mortality in ICU is is because of sepsis. And, and what we have started to now learn is <clears throat> immune system itself is very heterogeneous and the responses within sepsis patients are also heterogeneous. So we could, as we were talking about earlier, immune system can tell us what's going to happen to patient at presentation. And that allowed us to, or that basically uh, 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 helped us hypothesize that maybe there are different groups of patients within sepsis as a bucket, and that if we could identify these patients, then maybe we could start treating them better. So what we've been now focused on is identifying uh, 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 subgroups of patients, we call them endotypes of patients. So I, I endotyping um, uh, sepsis patients into different bucket, understanding what the underlying immune response is that puts them in that endotype, and then identifying either existing drugs that could treat those patients or uh, identifying drug targets that could be used to develop new drugs for those patients. And then the, the hope is in the next 10 years or so, we would now change sepsis from mostly one size fits all to understanding the endotypes and treating them accordingly. You know, I'm fascinated by your answer because never once did you mention the actual bacteria that the patients have. And it, sh it shows me that there's been a shift, at least in your thinking, that it's all about how the immune system is responding to this. And it all, I'm sure it matters what the bacteria is. And, and I would never say that that doesn't matter. But your, the comments that you just made highlighted that for you, it's the response of the, of the body to the infection exactly. that might be the key to treatment even more than what it is that's infecting the patient. Exactly. It's, it's, it's the hostess inability to respond appropriately and sufficiently that allows the bacteria to keep growing and patient doesn't recover. So I think of treatment as supporting the host in responding to bacteria. Thanks to Pravesh Khatri, that was the future of infectious disease immunology. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman. You can follow me on Twitter at R.B. Altman, and follow Stanford Engineering at Stanford E.N.G.